well, we're just gonna roll with it. Hey everybody, it's JB, and welcome to my project titled The Road to Top Surgery. This is a pretty lengthy collection of video diary entries from me on the week leading up to my top surgery. Throughout this video, you'll see a few different mediums used to record the content. I used a GoPro, I used my phone, and I also used my Canon Rebel T5i that I've had since 2017. And initially this was actually a project that I was going to be producing alongside some producers in LA who wanted to do a documentary on a trans person. It ended up not really coming to fruition. It kind of ended up being just something that I was producing by myself. So initially this was intended to be used alongside the stories of other people who were going through different phases of their transition or just living their life as a trans person. I would like to actually start trying to make documentaries like these slice of life video diaries of other trans people's experiences because I feel that it's really important to humanize trans people in the eyes of others, especially considering right now this project really was my first foray back into sharing my day-to-day -day life with people like I had been at the very beginning of my transition and I feel like it definitely deserved to be viewed by people, um, the people who I was talking to in these videos. So if you're here to check out kind of what that process looks like, what the emotional aspect of it is for people like me who have been trying to get top surgery for a really long period of time, or if you're just here to watch a slice of life um, video diary project, I just want to say welcome and uh, I hope you enjoy. So as we watch this video, I'm just going to pop in from time to time and provide context, background, um, even some hindsight reflections to kind of give this a little bit more of a storytelling quality than just a collection of video diary entries. Um, I hope I don't get too annoying. I promise I won't interrupt too much. Um, but yeah, uh, and of course, if you have any questions, um, feel free to include them in a comment, um, especially if you add a timestamp, I'll be able to go to that part of the video and then we can actually engage in a dialogue about what it is that you're specifically asking about. I'd really appreciate that type of engagement. Like, I have a feeling that I'm recording all of this stuff and it's never gonna get used. So my plan with this is basically what I'm going to do is I'm gonna leave the camera set up here. I've also got my GoPro set up here to help with kind of recording these few days leading up to the surgery. And I figured I would show you guys every time I put this ointment on and we just put it in a little time thing. So, uh, a time thing. You know what I mean. Don't stick things in your nose without doctor's approval. Bye. My partners and I are headed to the surgeon who is still not sure if he wants to let us film um, in his office. I'm a little anxious because, I mean, I've already been through this part before last year uh, with Dr. Barry in the UK, and um, it ended up being pushed and pushed and pushed by the pandemic, and then the cost went up, so I'm gonna try to see if they if they're gonna be willing to let me have my surgery sooner. If they've got like a cancellation list because it's like supposedly four to six weeks after the or four to six months after the consultation uh, that I'll have my surgery. So if they would just let me have it sooner, that'd be great. <laughs> the first time I tried to schedule my top surgery was actually going to be with Dr. Miles Berry out in the UK, who is well known for providing excellent results as well as great patient care. We did our consult actually at the very beginning of the pandemic through a phone call. I think it was back when everybody thought that COVID was going to be um, not a really long-term situation, that it was going to be everybody quarantines for a month, maybe two, and then everything will be back up and running. But between all of the shutdowns and shutdowns and shutdowns, and the new strains coming out and so many people getting sick and so many people dying. Um, the doctor and I think probably all of the UK 
felt that it wasn't necessarily safe for somebody outside of the UK to come in without quarantining for several weeks. So we rescheduled my surgery and the understanding was that I would quarantine for two weeks in advance and then I would have to remain there for two weeks for a follow-up appointment before I could come home. It ended up having to get pushed again uh, due to pandemic reasons uh, through no fault of Dr. Barry or his office. By the time it was time for me to really start making plans for that surgery, the cost had increased and I could no longer justify the cost of the surgery plus the cost of travel and the cost of lodging. Um, there was no way I was going to be able to afford all of that uh, in one go. So it ended up being a situation where I had to just accept that I was going to have to find a surgeon in the United States. All right, so I did my consultation with the doctor who is like, don't film me ever. I don't want it. They said they could get me in in October, which is huge. My surgery is at the end of October and I've got my pre-op and surgery appointments scheduled and then I'm like excited and a little bit nervous. I'm most nervous for the non-top surgery parts like the liposuction and the recovery on those because I know that's going to be brutal. But when it does finally like everything I heal from it, it's going to be really, really good. I drove back home grabbed my cash and came here and made a down payment so I could have the appointment in October. Um, and yeah, it's gonna be like about a six hour procedure. When the doctor did the first examination of like my body, he noted that like my left boob, which is significantly smaller than my right boob, uh, doesn't seem to have a bud in it. But because of the huge size difference, this one can be correct, and the lack of bud, this left one can be corrected with just lipo. So we're gonna do that, but the right one's gonna need like a, an incision and stuff. Now with the right one, so basically he was like trying to make it so that I wouldn't have any scarring. And he was like, but you might have to come back for a second surgery and all this stuff. And I'm like, look dude, I'm trans. I know I'm trans. I don't, I don't need to be cis. I don't need to be scar free. Um, and I don't need it to be even either because it never has been. <laughs> uh, so if you can fix this one without a scar and this one's gonna have to have a scar, okay. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with having one scar. I think that'll look kind of cool actually. Um, and we talked about lipo on my torso to sort of like masculinize that. And I said, I wanna add the fat from my belly and my boobs to my butt. And yeah, so we talked about that. Um, I know some of you are gonna be like, oh my God, he got like fully adjusted or whatever. Not a real body or whatever, but like all of it's still my own body parts. And like, you know, I think that we should have the right to make our bodies how we want them to be. And if I have the money to do that, which I only kind of do, uh, I'm gonna do that. So I, I have enough to cover about half. A little bit more than half of the cost so I'm gonna be taking out a loan or getting some financing um, and I'm gonna be doing some fundraising <sighs> if I had been working all last year this wouldn't be a problem but it is so, yeah I've got like two months to raise about 12 grand uh, and I'm gonna try to do it. So the initial plan for my surgery was actually that I was going to have top surgery, 360 lipo, and a BBL. And I still would like to get a BBL. It's obviously not at the very top of my priorities at the moment. Um, but it wound up being just too expensive. It would have equaled or even like rivaled the cost of traveling to and staying in the UK. I had planned to fundraise and try to save up money, but because of the way things were going in terms of not just the pandemic, but my own physical health and mental health, I found that I 
I wasn't going to be able to make up the difference in time. Additionally, when I mentioned that we were gonna do lipo on one breast and uh, a traditional mastectomy on the right breast, that did end up happening. Um, I did not have a bud in my left breast. Even though it was gonna be just one scar, the doctor did go ahead and try to make it even on both sides. So if you actually see my scars, you'll notice that one side goes further into the armpit than the other side, and that just had to do with the way that they were removing the tissue. I am currently at my pre-op appointment, and I just handed over the rest of the money I owed them for my surgery, which is on the 27th, so congrats to me. The appointment went well. I was concerned about my white blood cell count being low as being a problem with the surgery. It didn't even get brought up. And I wasn't gonna be the one to bring it up. So I'm assuming they saw everything and, and all's good. Um, doctor showed up, did some measurements, asked me if I had any questions. Apparently that was supposed to be part of it. Like I was supposed to have questions. My only real concern was like, I'm not familiar with the drains and why they have to happen. Uh, so I'm gonna have three drains, uh, one kind of in each chest area and then one for my back. Because in addition to top surgery, I'm getting some lipo. Um, and then he was just like, okay, we're gonna take some pictures, get you some prescriptions. We adjusted some of the prescriptions because there's, I'm allergic to fucking everything. Um, and he had to kind of adjust the way he's gonna do the procedure because uh, he needs to use lidocaine or some type of numbing agent. I have a reaction to lidocaine. Um, I usually get like a rash or like welts, which is awful. Um, so switching to something different, I don't remember what he said, but I, lidocaine's the only thing I've reacted to. Everything else has seemed to be fine topically or like injectedly anesthetic wise. Um, local anesthetic, that's the word. Um, I had to do the appointment by myself. I don't remember most of the appointment personally. This is the norm for doctor's appointments with me. I'm grateful because they sent me home with a packet and a bunch of stuff to use for the recovery process, prescriptions, all these things, because that packet's gonna be super useful. I'm gonna look through it today when I get home. Also kind of forced me to look at some things. Like I really had to look at, okay, my partner got in a car accident. All I could really think about was, I'm gonna have to go to my appointment alone, which is a really fucked up thing. Um, one of my partners said that it's not fucked up, that it's a very normal human thing to think about how events impact you personally. I would agree with him. I would add on to that. Most people don't only think about that. They usually also think about the other person who's being, or the other people who are being impacted, I think. So, uh, something that probably needs to be addressed at some point in my life. Top surgery's coming up. It is so close. I can fucking taste it. I cannot get excited about it. Because I've gotten excited about the last two times it was supposed to happen, and guess what? Pandemic. COVID came and ruined everything. So yeah, I'm dealing with a lot of shit. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my fucking best to hold myself together. Top surgery will happen. I'll be on drugs for a week. And then I will wake up and I will cry and scream. And I get to be angry about all of the shit that's been taken from me. But right now I don't have the capacity to do it. Because I know if I do, I'll just fall apart. The amount of people who told me, like, oh, let's, like, you're so hot, why would you want to be a guy? And it's like, it is not about one. I do not want to be trans. It's not a thing that I want. It is a thing that I have to fucking deal with every goddamn day. I have to push through. It's one more thing. I have to, like, one more layer of shit I have to wade through to get out of bed every morning. The extra layer on top of that is that society feels the same way about it. Obviously, at this point in time, I was really struggling with feeling 
anxious and also the frustration of feeling like I was having to deal with this by myself. For a lot of people um, who are transgender, who are experiencing dysphoria, who are experiencing the anxiety and the depression that come alongside being a dysphoric transgender person, um, it's really hard to see past the things that are directly impacting you in a negative way. It's really hard to look at anything beyond those barriers that you're facing on a day-to-day -day basis. You wake up in the morning and all you can think about is like, how am I going to, how, how am I going to handle this again today? So whenever there is stuff on top of the already like baseline of feeling just like total garbage all the time, it's really easy to get knocked down into a really negative headspace. And I think that's what I was experiencing at this point in time. It's the most depressed point uh, and anxious point that I had during this entire week. Um, and actually this was on October 11th, right after my initial pre-op appointment. So it's not even during the, the, the week, if you will, but I was afraid that it was going to happen again, where I was going to have a surgery scheduled and I wasn't going to be able to actually have it. And the last time that that happened um, was the first time in years that I had resorted to self-harm in order to cope with the, the feelings of wanting to um, die because I was never going to be able to be in the body that I wanted. And that was really how I was feeling. So in this moment, I'm having all of that on top of my partner just got in an accident. So obviously at that time I was dealing with a lot. Um, it doesn't excuse like the selfishness and the egotistical nature of what I was thinking and feeling. But the point of this documentary was for me to be honest with the camera, to be honest with the viewers. And even at my lowest points, I was supposed to turn on the camera and say, this is what I'm feeling. Um, so this is the, probably the most like negative part of the video itself but it definitely gets a lot more hopeful from here. Um, I am having top surgery in just a few days, so I figured it'd be really cool to show you guys kind of what the preparation for that looks like. Um, by the time this video airs, I will have had top surgery, I think, and then we'll do a follow-up video of me waking up, my reflections on the first week or weeks of recovery, um, but this is going to be kind of the days leading up to the top surgery aspect and then going into surgery and kind of going to leave you guys on a cliffhanger. So good luck with that. I didn't really find a lot of options that were what I was looking for, um, but I did end up finding this particular doctor um, who, for whatever reason, has asked that I not really talk about him on my YouTube channel. I'm not really sure what that's about. So initially, when this was going to be a documentary, I was going to have a camera person or a very, very small film crew actually come with me to all of my doctor's appointments, record what that looked like, what the dialogue was, what the process was. One of the biggest st stalling points for this documentary actually ended up being that doctor's reluctance to have any type of filming on premises, any type of mention of their practice in particular or their name. And it's unfortunate because I feel like the producers probably would have been more interested in telling my story if we'd been able to tell the whole story. Had I been in a better place in terms of my mental health, I might have even opted to postpone my surgery a little bit further until I could find a doctor who was one, more affordable, two, more experienced, and three, actually willing to be recorded by my crew. But by this point in time, I had already dealt with so many delays to the top surgery thing, and it was super brutal for me to have to go through my day-to-day -day life living how I was, that it was, it was no question. My mental health came before the storytelling, which in all honesty really was a first for me because I had always put artwork and storytelling and being a face for either for sex work or for trans people uh, ahead of my mental health. And at this state stage in my life, there was just no option for me to do that. There was no way that I was going to be able to do that 
and not just remain sane, but really remain alive. At this point, I was, for the most part, binding 24-7. I was sleeping in my binder. I was wearing it just nonstop. When I wasn't wearing my binder, I was wearing clothes that would really well disguise my figure. Additionally, um, I had gained weight, and the, the aspect that I appreciated about my weight gain was that it, it hid my chest a little bit more effectively than it would have had I been as skinny as I was before I started testosterone. So that kind of brings you to where I was headspace wise. I reached out to him and I was like, hey, look, I want to get top surgery done, but also there's some fat that I want to take care of on my stomach that I'm not really able to get off with cardio. Um, do you think that you could help me with that? And we came up with a package that would allow me to have top surgery as well as 360 liposuction in a relatively affordable range um, that should hopefully provide the results that I'm looking for. Now, what's really cool about this doctor is that uh, everything is in-house, so you're not going to a hospital for surgery. Um, they take care of all of like your like, pre-op appointments and um, they write prescriptions there and all that stuff, but it's not a hospital, which to me is super, super important. The downside, of course, is that they don't work with any insurance. Period, end of discussion. They do not take insurance. Pretty much all of my savings, kaput, gone out the window, but that's okay because that's what they were for. Not that I ever advise spending all of your money on trans things or really anything in general, but uh, this needs to happen, so that's what's happening. So the first time I met this doctor, um, I had one of my partners with me, and really, he kind of just kind of took an overall look and was like, okay, tell me what you want. Body shape and scarring. I have one boob that is like ridiculously large compared to the other one. We talked about potentially having to use two different types of surgery on either side of the chest and what scarring for that would look like. But throughout this whole conversation, I basically told him, I don't care what the scarring looks like as long as it's flat. I just need it gone. But of course he wouldn't take that for an answer. He said, look, I know that that's how you feel right now, but five years down the road, you might look at this and be like, man, I got a chop job and I don't want to do that to you. But the downside really for me with this doctor is he's not used to working with trans men. He's absolutely used to working with trans women, with um, cis women who are having breast augmentations, for cis men who are, are you know, streamlining their figure. Um, but in terms of trans men, he wasn't really sure how to interact with me specifically. Now, when I say that I felt like he didn't really know how to work with me, I don't think I did a good job of illustrating what I meant by that in this particular video, so I want to expand upon that. For me, being transmasculine does not mean I'm trying to or have a desire to emulate the cis male experience. I do have gender dysphoria related to like my physical aspects, they're not related to social dysphoria. I can be alone in a room by myself and still feel like I have a phantom limb, if you will. I can be alone in a room by myself, not being perceived by anyone, and would feel dysphoric about having breasts. So these are these are two physical attributes that I experience dysphoria with on a daily basis without social interactions that could also potentially cause dysphoria. However, I still value my femininity. I still value um, having somewhat of a feminine shape. I still value my hips. I still value having an, a nice curvaceous booty. These are things that that particular doctor just wasn't really able to grasp. He's very much in the understanding that trans people really operate on a binary just like probably him, um, where he is a man and a man and a man and that's it. Where his idea of what a well-built or ideal male figure is, you know, rectangular, blocky, broad shoulders, thin hips, like cute little butt, and that's great for him, but I found myself struggling to explain what it was that I was really looking for. Am I pleased with my results after the fact? On the whole, yes, there are still things that I wish had been left untouched, in particular my hips. I am pleased with the shape of my waist, I am pleased with the shape of my chest, 
Um, but I definitely was having concern in that moment of I may not have another opportunity to have top surgery for another year or more. And the idea of that uh, versus the alternative was, I mean, there was just no contest. Here's the cost, here's the breakdown. You tell us what you want to do, what you don't want to do, uh, and here's your pre-op date, and here's your top surgery official date. So that was really cool to walk out of that first appointment with everything in hand about like what I was going to be doing. Uh, the very first thing that I need to do starting today is this specific ointment that goes inside your nose. So it is a um, antibiotic. It's called mupiracin. Um, it goes in the sides of your nose uh, twice a day leading up to the surgery. And I think even after the surgery. I'm not entirely sure on that one. I'm going to double check with them. Um, and then we have hydrocodone, acetaminophen, so that's typical for uh, post-op stuff. Uh, we've got cephalexin, which I believe is an antibiotic. We have Montelukast, which uh, I'm not entirely sure what this is, so I'm going to look into it. Um, we have gabapentin, which is a pain thing. I actually used to have gabapentin as a prescription. It doesn't do much for me. I'm still going to take it anyway and see if it has any positive effects. And for the night before, they prescribed me to Mazepam, 15 milligram. I'm not going to take that. Anoxaparam sodium injection. Inject the contents of one syringe under the skin daily. Subcutaneous. Cool. And the final thing is they actually gave me two Ensure drinks to drink before the surgery, I guess, to like help with electrolyte balance and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of what we're looking at here. So the pre-op instructions include like these medications and stuff. Uh, drink the Ensure pre-energy drinks the following dates and times. So 9 p.m. the day before surgery, and then three hours prior to my arrival for the surgery. That'll be 3 a.m. Uh, remember, no eating or drinking after midnight except for the pre-surgery drink. Shower with surgical soap the night prior to your surgery and the morning of your surgery, which I actually have in my bag. I'm going to show you here. Um, do not wear makeup, deodorant, lotion, or perfume the day of your surgery. Don't wear jewelry. Leave your purse and wallet at home. Bring your photo ID and health insurance card. Wear a button-up or zip-up loose-fitting top with loose-fitting bottoms and slip-on shoes. Please wear your glasses if you need them and leave contacts at home. And bring a case for your eyeglasses. I don't have a glasses case. So I'm probably just gonna, like, have my partners hold my glasses. Um, alright, so now let's go over my little box that I've got set up here. That's not very heavy. It doesn't look like a lot, uh, but it is. So, uh, this little, uh, pack here, these are bath sponges. Now, I have a really hard time not, if I can't maintain my hygiene, I get really squirrely about it in terms of, like, brushing teeth and washing my body. So this, uh, you add water, you lather, you scrub, the towel dry, it's got 25 in here. So I feel like this is going to be plenty in terms of being able to keep myself clean during uh, post-op when I have the drains in. I've also got this right here, um, which is a mastectomy pillow. So I'm not entirely sure why this is going to come in handy, but everyone who's had top surgery has told me to get one. So I did. Uh, I'm not, like I said, I'm not really sure what it's going to do for me, except maybe it'll help kind of like keep my arms off of the, the surgical spot and sort of protect and pad it. <laughs> yeah. I never actually ended up using that mastectomy pillow. I didn't figure out what it was for. Um... As a matter of fact, the recovery from the top surgery itself was incredibly easy, like incredibly easy. There really was not much, I wasn't feeling anything. Even after I stopped taking the pain medication, um, I was not feeling a damn thing. Um, so those are the two things that I bought for myself that aren't part of what the surgeon gave me. And then the surgeon gave me all the stuff in this nice little black bag. Um, so we have 
something to pee in, but I think it's probably actually for draining, uh, like cleaning out the drains. Um, we'll see. Some little pads. We've got some foam uh, for the lipo, for under the faja. We have kinesthesiology tape, which I can't use uh, because I am allergic. So if anybody needs any, shoot me a message, I'll send it to you. We've got hydrogen peroxide, which I already have anyway, but this is 3%, so a little stronger than what I've got. Uh, benzoin tincture uh, swab stick. I'm assuming this is for cleaning around um, the like locations uh, of the incisions. Not entirely sure though, but that's I think what it's probably gonna be used for. <laughs> So we have this, and it looks like pee, uh, but this is actually surgical soap that I need to wash with. This is it. This is this is the surgical soap, um, but it's in a pee cup, and that makes me really happy. Antibiotic ointment, uh, which I'm assuming is also going to be used probably around the, uh, the incision sites, and of course the Ensure energy drinks, which are strawberry, and I'm grateful for that because like. Strawberry is one of my favorite flavors. Uh, so that's it. That's all I've got in this little this little box here. And then I just have like all of these medications just chilling on the counter because I don't want to forget that they exist. So this is one of the last days I'm gonna be wearing my binder. I'm gonna show you guys here. Lipo was incredibly rough. The recovery from that was really difficult. I don't do well in tight clothing. Uh, in restrictive clothing, it makes me feel claustrophobic, makes me feel really just anxious, and the fabric that they use to make fajas tends to be like the kind that makes me feel like I have a bunch of tiny spiders all over my skin, which is really, really uncomfortable. And on top of that, you, you have to wear it 24 seven, like you cannot take it off or you risk not just ruining the results, but actually causing actual health problems for yourself. So it was a real struggle for me, for sure. And those cosmetic sponge pads, those little foam pads that I um, pulled out there, not only did they include latex, which I am allergic to, but you're supposed to put them in to help shape your body. And unfortunately, and there really wasn't room for me to put those little foam pads in. And I did it anyway, and I ended up with some pretty significant bruising. It was not a good time recovering from lipo. I don't think I'm ever gonna really be able to do that again. So we'll have to figure out a different way to do the BBL. If somebody wants to donate their fat, I'll take it. <laughs> those, little, those little pads, they almost looked like period pads that I held up. Uh, they were actually used to provide compression. It was supposed to help prevent extensive scarring. Unfortunately, I did end up keloiding despite following all of the uh, rules and instructions for the top surgery part. So it kind of just didn't really do much for me. This is the ointment. It hasn't been opened yet, so we're going to open it. Okay, It's got one of these, I really like opening things with these little pokies. Pretty cool, right? Okay. Here we go. I don't know why that's so satisfying, but it is. Here it is. Okay, so this is gonna be terrible. I'm also mildly scared because I'm pretty allergic to a lot of antibiotics. All right, so then it's a pea size. That's like a pea size. And then you're supposed to stick it up in your nose. Oh my God, this is terrifying. I can't believe what I'm doing. I really don't want to do this, you guys. Oh my fucking god. Okay, here we go. So then you just wipe it in on the insides of your nostril. And that's it. Ugh, it reminds me of, um... You know when you're sick and your parents put, like, Vaseline and Vicks and stuff all up in your nose? Ugh, awful. Okay. Oh god. Almost like a COVID tester. Oh, this one can go all the way in. Ugh, I'm literally picking my nose on YouTube. Fucking disgusting. Uh, right, so that's it. That that's the uh, that's the first medication, and I'm supposed to do that twice a day. Ugh.
My eyes are watering right now. But it's not as bad as COVID test. It's not shoving a pipe cleaner up your nose, so. So I guess the reason for doing this, according to the pamphlet, is uh, to kill any MRSA bug that may be in there. Ta-da. <laughs> I have a zit. That's a big one. Please ignore the pimple on my face. Pimples. Who am I kidding? My pores are like the size of moon craters. Maybe putting you in front of the mirror was not a great idea. Okay. I'm at a point. This happens just about every autumn uh, where I, you know, heavily consider quitting sex work. And I think I'm actually going to do it this time. Retiring is really hard because existing in an industry like this, it takes grit to be here. The money used to be really good for me. Transitioning obviously has like pretty much made that not a thing anymore. 2020, I watched that year take all of the hopes and dreams of my career and flush them down the toilet. I think I've finally just come to grips with that. Like I really, the last week or so, started like actually evaluating my goals because while it might not seem like it to you, like this is a huge barrier for me. It has always been a huge barrier for me and it comes with a lot of trauma. There's a lot of stuff that I haven't processed because I've been waiting for this. I don't know why this has to be the thing to like break the dam, but like I'm, I'm right there. After top surgery, all of that is going to come crashing down on me, I know it. And I'm ready for it, like I'm ready to move forward with my life. So a lot of what I've been trying to do for myself is to look at middle school me, because that's when everything changed, right? Like, up until middle school, really, I didn't, I didn't have to worry too much about feeling uncomfortable in my own skin. I was a kid, so I'm just trying to reclaim that. So I actually, as I mentioned in this video, I contemplated just about every fall time whether or not I wanted to continue working in the adult industry. And I'm working on a memoir to kind of catalog my experiences and talk about a whole slew of things. But one of the topics that I really do want to cover is my relationship with my work. I loved my job and I didn't have a healthy relationship with it. Like any job, work-life balance is incredibly important, and that was one thing that I just, I, I wasn't able to really access that with this particular job. Not just because I loved what I was doing, but also because I am actually not an extrovert. I am an introvert, and so having constant human interaction for weeks on end without really much of a break, um, as well as being restricted to a single location, not able to leave, definitely took a huge toll on my mental health and well-being. I'm not anti-sex work, I'm not anti-full-service sex work. I would say that at this point, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm anti-brothel, specifically with the type of system that we have set up in the United States, in Nevada, where you're giving such a significant portion to the brothel of your earnings and on top of that, there is no union, there is nobody really to organize and help you fight for your workers' rights. It leads to a lot of people being taken advantage of, and it leads to a lot of people like myself finding themselves trapped in a situation where they love their job, they want to continue what they're doing, but in order to do that, they have to be in this situation or operate in a way that will get them arrested. It didn't leave me with a lot of options. Um, and then eventually, obviously, my health made it so that I wasn't able to pass the talent testing test uh, for HIV. I don't have HIV. I think what their test is or was at the time is just an ANA test. And I do have a high ANA titer, but confirmatory tests show that I don't have HIV. So the chances are I have some other autoimmune disorder and it has just been really impossible to see a rheumatologist in Nevada. I still haven't found a resolution on that, which means that I was taking a chance every single time that I would go in to be tested that I would be wasting $200 um, because by the time I would be able to get a, the results from the confirmatory tests, 
my initial testing results would be invalid. So that was the key factor in me stopping working in the full service industry and eventually retiring also from producing films. And, you know, I mentioned in this video that transitioning definitely decreased the amount of money that I was making in the ranches. And I think two things, two very important things happened that really decreased my income as a full service sex worker. The first thing is that um, I moved. I moved brothels. Um, when I was working at Sherry's, the standard was a lot higher in terms of what you were bringing in and the marketing that Sherry's had was and is superior to the marketing that Chicken Ranch, I think, has ever done. Was Sherry's more restrictive to the workers? Yes. Um, was the Chicken Ranch safer? Did I feel happier there? I felt like I was in a community at the Chicken Ranch versus being at Sherry's. I very much felt alone and um, anxious. So quality of life at Chicken was absolutely better, but income at Sherry's was better. And so that was the first thing was that I moved ranches. The second thing is that um, my transition was supposed to take place over a period of time and it was supposed to be very gradual. And so I was going to be continuing to see my clients on a regular basis at the chicken ranch and we were going to work together to come up with a marketing strategy that would not only bring them in more people and a more diverse range of people, but would also allow me to transition a lot more safely and to help get people more comfortable with my new appearance. Unfortunately, um, I started my transition right before the pandemic hit and then really nobody saw me for 14 months. And I, as some of the memes say, emerged from the COVID cocoon this, you know, beautiful boy. <laughs> and it was a shock, obviously, to my fan base. I was still continuing to produce video content, um, but also not at the rate that I had been because I was now living with a child. There was a lot, a lot of stuff that really happened that led to the conclusions I had drawn at this point in the video of, you know what, like, I am not, I'm not happy anymore and I'm not making money. This is not sustainable. Sure. All right, so I just got out of the shower. I'm looking up here because I have a GoPro and I'm looking down here because I've got my Camera, camera, let's turn on some lights. I did not show you guys last night's uh, nose uh, swab. Uh, to make up for it, I <laughs> have no shirt on right now. Um, I hate this very, very much. I always forget that it's in my nose and I go to blow my nose because I have really bad allergies and so I get stuffy and runny. It ends up being that I basically waste like half of the dose, but that's probably why they have put so much. Okay. Piece size bit here. There we go. I'll kind of wipe up that little bit there. One down, one to go. Ugh. This is this is like not fun. go and farther in and farther up yeah how's it look decent that's it god I hate that <coughs> Ah, oh, shit, I put the cap on upside down again. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's the dose. Uh, today, I am experiencing feelings of, like, dread a little bit. Primarily regarding the fact that, like, it's happening. Um, <laughs> 
I'm excited, but I'm also terrified that he's going to mess it up so bad. Uh, and I'm worried that I'm not as prepared as I should be for it, like, logistically. But I know that that's not the case. Like, I'm as prepared as I can get. So... I have been spending most of my time writing and working on my stories. I uh, have done a little bit more introspection and yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm quitting the adult industry, which is huge, really, really huge. Um, I'm waiting until after surgery to officially decide that because, you know, business might pick up when I chop off the titty, I don't fucking know. Um, but yeah, I, I really just kind of want to focus on being a dad and writing and getting my books out because that's, um, that's what little middle school me would have wanted, so. That's what we're doing. Um, all right. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw today, you want to see more mental breakdowns and medication, hit that button down below. Subscribe, become a member of the Jackalope Tribe and earn your antlers. And don't forget to follow me on all of these social media platforms, which I will list here because I don't feel like listing them with my mouth. Uh, and remember, you are awesome and you freaking got this. Should I start these by being like captain's log? Hey everybody, it's JB, and I am here to do the next dose of this stuff. I have to put it in my nose like some kind of maniac. Um, so today was a pretty simple day. I finally figured out what was giving me sensory overload, and it just happened to be a shirt that was like the wrong kind of soft. Sensory overload. I actually learned that phrase from my parents during my childhood. So for my dad, um, he would have moments where it would be like, everybody just needs to be quiet. I didn't learn until much later <laughs> that sensory overload is something that people with ADHD and autism actually experience, as well as I'm sure anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, and probably OCD. I obviously had to learn how to identify what things cause me to experience this sensory overload. And one of the most um, overwhelming things for me is clothing textures. So yeah, I, I found this to be really fascinating because um, I'm, I'm almost foreshadowing the next uh, couple of weeks of just extreme sensory overload. So I got rid of that shirt. I'm doing a lot better there. Um, and I basically just drove up to the mountain and back. That's pretty much all I did today. I also played Dungeons and Dragons with my partners and one of my friends. Oh, here we go. Can you see me? Okay. God, this is awful. Oh. Ha. Oh, the urge to sneeze with that is terrible. One more. Twice a day. It's pea sized. Ah, uh, awful. Hate it. Absolutely hate it. Uh, um, I think I officially completed my short story for my winter anthology submission yesterday, technically. I'll be working on the first ever short story that I'll be releasing to my Patreon. It takes place in a brothel. Uh, it's a haunted brothel. So our protagonist gets to experience some really spooky stuff. I think it'll be great uh, to read on Halloween. And my goal length for this, honestly, like, I shouldn't really make it longer than 5,000 words, specifically because I don't think I could complete anything longer than that before my surgery date. But I might be aiming for around 10,000 words. We'll see. Um, and then my plan with all of these short stories that get published in my Patreon I will eventually, like, five to ten years down the line, compile them into just, like, volumes of collections of short stories that I've written, and eventually publish those, so. I went ahead and talked to the Polycule, and pretty much everybody's in support of me quitting sex work and switching over to, uh, the 
house spouse role and being uh, an author. I'm not like enormously depressed and suicidal because of my job. I want to do my job, unfortunately I can't. Um, and I've kind of lost joy in it, so I'm finding a new joy. Well, I'm rekindling my old passion, uh, which should have been my focus from the start, so. Goodness, you're so big. What a big kitty. Yeah, hello. Oh, say hello. Good morning. Is there a puppy in there? Hello. Boba. This is the puppy. Okay, I love you. Back up you go. Where are you going? <laughs> is that your Boba? Oh, hello. These are the little ones. <laughs> you're such a happy kitty. Oh, you're both so cute. Yes, you are. Come here. My babies. These are they. She's a little bit stoned. Hey, everybody. It's JV, and I just got out of the shower. Uh, I've got pants on this time and a binder uh, and today I'm going to be having a little bit of me time. We're about to do the next dose of nose things. Ew, gross. Um, but also, oh and look at this zit. It's not horrible. That's what I had a band-aid covering up the other day. It looks a lot better today though. In terms of me time, that just kind of usually means a drive out into nature and I go spend time there. Today it's a little something different. I'm going to be visiting the Sekhmet Temple, which is out by Cactus Springs. Um, it's on my route to work, so my plan really is going to be visit the Sekhmet Temple, stop by work and pick up my paycheck, my final paycheck, and then um, I, there's an altar that I've built out there in the back part of the property that I'm going to go ahead and leave an offering there as well. So that's kind of my plan for the day. I'm going to clear out my nose and then I'm going to put the stuff in it. Super gross. It's got me accountable on these things though. Okay, goodness, here we go. Ugh. Awful. Ugh. Ugh. Okay, next one. Goodness. Ugh. Dang it, every time I put this cap on upside down. I don't remember if I told you guys the other day, um, my kid finally started working on a book that uh, kiddo wants to write, and so we, it was actually the night that I came back that I was like, I didn't end up doing the video for my nose swab, um, because kiddo wanted to write with me and my partners and we usually go right at the Aliante around 8 p.m. and don't end up home until almost 1 in the morning um, and so kiddo got to go with us and absolutely ate that up so kiddo's been writing about uh, 400 words a day which is pretty good considering the chapters are about 600 words in this uh, type of book so I'm excited to see how it turns out yeah it's exciting, I'm a little bit proud. Obviously by this point in the video, I was feeling a lot more excited, a lot more at peace, um, and I was starting to see the bright side of things. Um, being excited about my kid working on a story, uh, they had several different ideas and said, well, I wanna write this, I wanna write this, I wanna write this. So when they finally actually did start putting words on paper, I was super excited for them. Their mom actually also is a writer and is good at editing, so they have two people who are really passionate about storytelling and books that they can bond with, really. So I was really doing well this day. Tomorrow I'll do my shot of tea, which is gonna be less than what it normally is.
one vial a week had me at like 1500 testosterone and it really should be between like 600 and 900 so i haven't had my doctor's appointment for it yet because i'm kind of avoiding seeing that doctor at all costs but um i am reducing my dose down to 0.25 a week which sounds a lot more realistic hello uh so i ended up missing two doses of the nose stuff just completely because i had a migraine um, but I am getting ready to head out now for the writing thing that I do just about every night at the Aliante. Um, I think I'm as migraine-free as I'm going to get right now, uh, which means it is time for the stuff. Also, I had a nosebleed for like four hours. It was real gross. All right, let's do this. If you hear music in the background, it's a uh, soundtrack. One of the auto play YouTube things I've got going for um, for writing, you know, stimulating the brain, leaving present space and going into like imaginary headspace. Clearly, I have not gotten my mouth words back, which is a little frustrating. But all right, and today is the twenty fifth, so we're just shy or we're uh, actually less than two days away from the surgery like a day and a half away from the surgery i'm fucking terrified uh, i've got my new boyfriend coming into town here we go ready Ugh, awful absolutely awful Ugh. um the day after my surgery to kind of help with house things and me care which is really sweet uh, but tomorrow I have a friend who is also kind of getting ready to quit full service uh, sex work and so I'm this person has I've had a crush on them for a long time a very long time so I invited them to hang out. I'll probably go get like coffee or something and I'm gonna say, hey, I've had a crush on you for a while and see if it goes somewhere. Oh yeah, I remember that. Um, it didn't go bad, but nothing came of it. We're both still friends. We text from time to time, but there's not really a means for us to have a relationship even if that was something that both parties wanted. At this point in my life, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm good with where I am right now and I don't want to add any more relationships because <laughs> it's a lot, it's a lot going on in my life. Um, but at that point in time, I was definitely interested in having another partner. That's it really. Um... I'm like freaking exhausted from this migraine, but I'm here and I'm ready to rock and roll. So I'm gonna do that. Hey everybody, it's me. Uh, fun fact, I have not slept in 24 hours and I sure as fuck look it. So uh, today is the 26th, it is Tuesday. It is 1.30 in the afternoon. It is time for my next dose of the nose stuff. That's why I keep touching my fucking nose. And yeah, I have not slept. <laughs> uh, between trying to finish my short story, which is still not done uh, for Patreon, driving my kid to school in the morning at like 5.30 a.m., being emotional support for my partner who had to have a duo colonoscopy and endoscopy procedure, which she was super nervous about, and a migraine that also gave me full body tremors for about two hours, uh, and then the final straw of course being that my cat knocked down my one of my potted plants from up here and threw dirt all over the floor. Um, yeah, I, I have not had a chance to sleep because then it was time to start preparations for 
you know, this, the being ready for surgery. So that meant making sure the room is ready, making sure the bathroom is ready. You know, I'm about to go scrub the toilet after I do this whole nose thing, uh, cleaning up the litter box, you know, wiping everything down, making sure things are sanitary. I needed to repot one of my plants, my rattlesnake over here, which I'm gonna show you guys. So this isn't the one that my cat knocked over, but this is, this is my rattlesnake. Um, these are really cool plants because they follow the sun. So they open up super wide during the daylight to catch all of the sun. Check that out. Super pretty. Uh, and then they close up at nighttime to, you know, I guess because there's no sun to soak up. Uh, so she needed to be repotted because she outgrew her pot. I got these two lovely ones. Everybody's due for watering today. So we have my basil, which is thriving in our humid bathroom shower region. And then this cute little succulent and a hitchhiker. Uh, I have no idea what type this offshoot is over here, uh, but it's something and it's cute. So yeah, both of these are doing really well. I actually got uh, this one from a Tamed Wild box, which is pretty cool. Uh, so these are the plants. Uh, but the one that got knocked over is in the kitchen and I want to bring it in here to show you guys because it's an Ocotillo and it was a gift from a client who apparently has one and cut off, uh, brought off a cutting for me and got it, actually got it rooted because I've wanted one for a very long time. Um, when we first moved to the desert it actually was a really cool plant uh, that kind of made me feel a little bit more like I could try to thrive here instead of just, you know, being depressed. Um, so the Ocotillo is really cool because it can survive like incredibly long droughts because it basically just survives. Uh, I'll show you guys. Give me a sec. This sweet thing, this little piece here uh, fell off from up here when it got knocked over. And then this guy got a little bent out of shape, but I'm, that's what the stick is for. So these things are really cool because uh, you've probably seen them uh, driving through Vegas. They're used as landscaping out here, um, where it just looks like a bunch of dry sticks sticking up out of the ground. Um, so when they're in a drought, these things actually drop all of their leaves and kind of dry up and become brittle and just keep the water down by the base of their roots. Um, but then once they get enough water, they actually flower really beautifully. So they produce these deep, dark green red uh, green leaves here. Um, my camera isn't focusing too well. They produce these deep green leaves here, which are also like a succulent, waxy type of a deal. Um, and then also these like bright reddish orange um, flowers, which are absolutely gorgeous. So uh, because we are entering like winter time, uh, this guy's gonna kind of power down, you know, only get watered about once a month. But right now, I'm just trying to make sure that it survives. Yeah, it didn't survive. Actually, none of those plants survived my surgery recovery. Because I won't be able to do a lot of like nursing and, and caring for it while I'm in recovery, at least the first couple weeks. So, all right, we're gonna put this guy back and then do the nose thing that I've been procrastinating by showing you my plants. All right, let's do this. I've got to do this one more time after this, and then I don't think I need to do it anymore. Super gross. Here we go. God, I hate this. Ugh. Okay, there's one. Two. Oh, the right one's always so much easier. Oh, probably because it's all bloody. Lovely. Okay. We'll close up. I'm gonna put the cap on right this time. So I've talked through with my partners uh, and friends a little bit of the things that are giving me anxiety, and I'm actually feeling a lot better today about anxiety and 
the surgery and all that sort of stuff. This is probably like the last time I'll show you guys these before they get, you know, chopped off. It'll be interesting, like, having it be numb. That's the new thing that's kind of squicking me out now. Like, got the, the drains covered. I'm not worried about, like, regretting it after anymore. I'm a little bit worried about the scars, like, how bad they're going to be. Um, but what's really squicking me out is, like, having, like, a whole part of my body be numb. I've already got some of that on my leg. So it'll be interesting. It will be very interesting. Um, needless to say, I am ready. That's all I got. Hey, everybody. Today is the day. I just got out of the shower. I have scopolamine patch attached to my body. It's very uncomfortable. That should help. And I've basically not slept in almost two days. I did actually manage to get a little bit of rest last night. Uh, but as you can imagine, I am nervous and excited. Um, my GoPro is having formatting issues and has been for the past, like, overnight and into right now. Uh, yeah, what are you gonna do? Murphy's Law, right? Uh, so yeah, this is going to be, actually, yesterday was the last day I would ever have to wear this particular binder. And, uh, I'm a little bit nervous, I'm not gonna lie. But I feel actually more calm about it right now than I did last night, which is weird. But, I'm excited. I'm in a, you know, they're like, oh, button-up shirt. So I'm in my pajama button-up shirt and a loose pair of pants. We're gonna brave the cold because today is October 27 and it is the day that I chop off the titty. Loading into the truck to drive about 40 minutes and go get the surgery. I'm super nervous because I will be obviously driving, like headed this way tomorrow also for my post-op appointment and I know that I'm going to be like in pain and tight so I'm not I'm not super looking forward to that but I'm ready all right guys I'm getting ready to go in I just want to say thank you everyone for your support um I really appreciate the I don't know thoughts and prayers and everyone who's kind of helped me get to where I'm at today so thank you But it's done. It's done. There's no titties. That's nice. I touch it and it's flat. Yeah. It's very flat. <laughs> Why are you so stoned? You've heard me. If you like what you saw today, do you want to see more? Hit that button down below. Subscribe. Become a member of the Jack Over Tribe. And earn your antlers. And don't forget to follow me on all the social media platforms. Which I will list somewhere on this video. I love you, and you can do this. Top surgery is expensive, but it's worth it if it's something you need in order to feel happy in your life. And I encourage you uh, that you're not alone. You should run like a Patreon or something, because you're fucking beautiful and you got this. I'll tell you, I was really messy. Uh, <laughs> In this situation, I woke up hallucinating. The first thing that I hallucinated was that I thought that, okay, there was a meme that I had seen prior to going into surgery that was somebody took the worm thing from Dune and mixed it with one of the rabbits from Watership Down. I'll see if I can find it, and if I can, I'll post a picture in this video here. Um, I was hallucinating that that had like was behind my bed like next to me and it seemed normal like I wasn't afraid I was like oh yeah it's just like the normal like pet that you get as a part of having top surgery not really sure why that was the reasoning but and then I blinked 
And I, uh, oh, then I asked, you guys see that? And the nurse and my partner both looked at me like, what? And then I blinked. And then the next thing I knew, I was staring down at a giant cake made of scopolamine patches. It was like giant scopolamines layered on top of each other and I was holding it. And if you know anything about scopolamine, you know that you're not supposed to touch it because then if you touch your eyes, you can cause like damage or dilation to your eyes. And I was holding it and touching it, I was like, am I allowed to have this? And they both looked at me again and they're like, what? And I looked down and there was no cake and it was like the trippiest thing. Yeah, and then I did not want to wait to put clothes on. I wanted to get in the car and go home. And so I left in my Faha without clothes. I would not let them put clothes on me. Um, unaware that there's just an opening in the Faha for, you know, bodily functions. And it wasn't until I was like getting into the car that I was like, I feel a breeze on my cheeks. And I looked back at the nurse and I was like, is my ass hanging out? And she was like, yes. And I was like, oh well, the whole internet's seen it anyway. <laughs> and I got in the car and we left. My favorite line in this whole scene, aside from, you know, the funny, um, YouTube outro, I'm not really sure why I did that, uh, is I touch it and it's flat. I was so pleased to know that they were not there anymore. So that was my journey to top surgery. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you and your time. I do plan to make more of these. I have one that I'm working on that is my recovery from top surgery. After that, I would like to do a series that will cover my bottom surgery. And then of course, I would like to extend this to cover other people's life stories and share those with my followers here on YouTube in these sort of long form documentaries that include commentary from the people who created them. As always, thank you for watching. If you like what you saw today and you wanna see more, hit that button down below and subscribe, become a member of the Jackalope tribe and earn your antlers. It doesn't want to do the little antlers. There we go. And don't forget to follow me on social media. All of my social media posts at this point in time are scheduled. I check it online once a month uh, to respond to messages and comments. But if you really want to see what I'm up to real time, the best thing you can do is subscribe to my newsletter. I send out emails with no consistency or regularity whatsoever about life updates, current book projects I'm working on, new book releases. I also provide links to free and discounted books from indie authors who write similar content to me. I also host open calls for alpha and beta readers as well as people who do cover art um, or feel like they might have something to contribute to my work because I would love to offer other people a platform uh, to share their art. Thanks again and I will see you next time. No idea when that will be, but I wanna say happy Pride Month and to all the trans people out there, I know times are hard right now. Just remember that there is hope and trans joy is resistance. So go out there, be your beautiful, joyful self. And remember that your community is here for you. There are allies. And as long as there's someone out there to have hope, hope exists and there's a chance that things will turn out for the better.